Well, Ellen, thank you for joining us for our monthly Facebook Q&A with Bishop Gaynor. As always, we are uh, very excited to have the Bishop join us and to sit down and spend some time with us. Uh, you know, Bishop, we appreciate it. I know you have a very busy schedule, so we always appreciate you spending some a couple moments with us. Well, I'm happy happy to include this on my schedule, Rachel, and I, I, it's always a, give me an opportunity to think about some topics that uh, uh, people are asking questions uh, about, and uh, I hope I can uh, make some uh, understandable response to those uh, questions. Oh, great. So we actually have quite a few questions uh, for this this month. So I think we'll jump right in. And our first question is from Jorge. Uh, and his question is, what is the filioque controversy? And would you explain why the Eastern Orthodox Church split from the Catholic Church? Well, the filioque controversy is very much at the heart of the separation of the Church of the West, uh, the Latin Catholic Church, and those Eastern Orthodox churches. Uh, filioque is a Latin word meaning and the son. Filius is a Latin word for son. And the controversy has to do with our understanding and our ability to talk about the very mystery of the Trinity. We have to go back to the first and second ecumenical councils. So the first ecumenical council was in 325, the Council of Nicaea. And as often happens, the ecumenical councils were called because there was some theological controversy. Some uh, teacher, often a bishop, uh, was saying, um, well, this is the way we need to understand this, or this is the truth. And, and the, the church would say, oh, it just doesn't sound right. So the bishops would gather in an ecumenical council to kind of hammer out um, the more accurate uh, way of expressing the theological truth that was being questioned. And the Council of Nicaea had to focus upon the true, humani true humanity and true divinity of Jesus. There were those uh, Arians, a uh, heresy very early in the church that denied the true divinity of Jesus. So a creed was written in the Council of Nicaea, and it's, so we believe in the Father. It sounds very much like the creed that we know, except when it came to the Holy Spirit, it simply said, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, period. Uh, that, and we talked about this in one of the earlier mm -hmm. shows, the Nicene Creed and the, the creed then that was uh, changed at the Council of Constantinople. So that was 325. Later in the fourth century, 381, there was the second ecumenical council in Constantinople. And there, it wasn't so much a controversy about the divinity and humanity of Jesus, but they wanted to enlarge the teaching about God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so at the Council of Constantinople, a creed emerged which elaborated our understanding of how the Holy Spirit proceeds within the mystery of the Trinity. And it simply said, the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, period. And it went on to speak about the Holy Spirit, but who proceeds from the Father. This actually is uh, in accord with what our Lord himself says in the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel, where he says, uh, I will send you another helper, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father. And I, that's where perhaps the Council Fathers took that, that phrase uh, for the Constantinopolitan Creed. So, uh, that was the creed that was professed, and eventually, as, as the church matured, the creed became part of the liturgy, and it was professed, as we do today on Sundays and solemnities, we profess the creed. But the Latin church fathers, some really, really important, influential theologians like uh, Ambrose and Augustine and Jerome, Gregory the Great, um, they began in their writings to elaborate on the mystery of the Trinity and to say that the Holy Spirit comes from a double procession. It comes from the Father and from the Son. And that filioque and the Son became included in time in the creed. And so it was the mystery that the Holy Spirit, and this of course is timeless. There's not some point when the Holy Spirit comes into existence from all eternity, co-equal to the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit proceeds within the divine community of the three persons in one God. Um, 
The Eastern churches took issue with this because of that addition. It wasn't said in the council, but it really grew up as a theological uh, understanding of the Holy Spirit's procession within the mystery of the Trinity. And it became a great controversy. That's why it's called the Filioque controversy, the and the son, the, the double procession of the Holy Spirit uh, within the Trinity. The Western mind is, is perhaps more analytical. And we're saying, well, if, if the God the Son proceeds from the Father and has everything co-equal with the Father except fatherhood, then how can God the Father have a second procession that proceeds from him that would be different than the Son? And that's why the Latin fathers, those uh, Augustine, uh, Ambrose, Jerome, added and the Son. As they analyzed this, there had to be something new in the procession of the Holy Spirit, and they added the filioque and the Son, the double procession of the Holy Spirit from uh, in, in, in the origin of the third person of the Trinity. So in 1054, this controversy, among others, it was one, but it was a main one, this idea of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit comes forth within the mystery of the Trinity became an extremely contentious point. And the Church of Constantinople separated from Rome. And uh, that's the origin uh, of uh, uh, of the Orthodox churches in the world. But I will say, despite that, that controversy, from 1999 until 2003, there were dialogues um, that were held here in the United States with the North American Orthodox Church and our Roman Catholic Church. And we came to certainly an agreement on, on the truths involved here. This is all a, 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 a uh, controversy over how to describe uh, really a, a supernatural mystery, the very life of God. And, and so the, the, what's at stake here is we all believe that God is a trinity, three persons in one God. That's solid in our Catholic faith, in the Orthodox faith. And in those dialogues that went on for four years, we, we simply said, well, we have the same Trinitarian faith. Uh, it's just, a, it's a different way of trying to understand that which cannot be fully understood, uh, a supernatural mystery. But we made progress at least in, 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 in moving forward in that, but it was a terrible controversy in the 11th century. And in 1054, there was the split, which remains today between Catholic churches, and we have our Catholic churches of the East, as well as the Eastern Orthodox churches, all over that one word, filioque, and the Son. Okay. Excellent, Bishop. I didn't know any of that. So. Well, well, <laughs> well it's, it's a, in theology, it's a very important uh, topic and, uh, and, and the sad division. And as I said, it was a main point, but not the only point that caused the separation of the, the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, so our next question comes from Cassie, and uh, Cassie is curious about what is a red mass? A red mass. Well, we, we just had ours in the diocese not so long ago. We, we, we have it in the month of October. And the red mass takes its name from the vestments that the celebrants wear uh, for that mass. They're red. And uh, when we wear red, uh, it, it uh, is a sign uh, either of a martyr, but in the case of the Red Mass, it's a sign that it is a mass of God the Holy Spirit. So the Red Mass invokes God the Holy Spirit and asks for the gifts and inspiration of the Spirit to guide the work of all those in the legal professions. Um, it's also called the Red Mass because in many places in Europe and still today, but going back to the high Middle Ages where the Red Mass began, uh, the judges wore scarlet robes. And so both the celebrant of the Mass and the deacons, the ministers would have red vestments on because it was a mass of the Holy Spirit. And then members of the judiciary, especially the higher courts, had these beautiful scarlet robes and they would be in their judicial robes attending the mass. So the first red mass, I think on record, happened in the first half of the uh, 14th century in Paris. So it goes, goes way back. Uh, the first red mass in the United States was in 1877 in Detroit. 
And then in 1939, uh, Washington, D.C. began to celebrate uh, a red mass. And of course, that's the seat of our highest court, the Supreme Court. Uh, and so on the, the Sunday before the first Monday of October, uh, in Washington, we have the Red Mass because the Supreme Court begins its new session on the first Monday of October. So the, the day prior to that, the Sunday before that, um, usually the Archbishop of Washington, the Cardinal Archbishop, uh, uh, will gather with members of the Supreme Court and all members of the judiciary. It's also all of those in the legal profession and those from the legislature. Those are the ones who make the laws and the uh, judiciary, of course, uh, interprets uh, the application of the laws. So um, it, it is a, a mass uh, where we invite the Holy Spirit to guide that important work uh, of those who serve us in the judicial and legislative branches of, of our government. Excellent. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, so our next question comes from Jonathan. And Jonathan is wondering uh, if you think that the Vatican would ever consider adding the prayer of St. Michael to the end of our masses. Sure, the, the prayer of St. Michael, the archangel, which we pray here in the Diocese of Harrisburg for some time now. Um, the Vatican did uh, legislate or include in the liturgy uh, that prayer along with other prayers that were called the Leonine prayers. Pope Leo XIII um, uh, uh, ordered that certain prayers for the conversion of Russia and the prayer of St. Michael the Archangel be recited at, at the end of Mass. So there was a time when that was uh, mandated by, uh, by the Vatican, by the Pope. Um, whether or not uh, our current Holy Father or a future uh, a Pope uh, would do so is, is impossible to tell. Uh, but in a way, uh, I, I would imagine just uh, since the Second Vatican Council, it would, it would be my opinion that the Pope would let that decision up to the bishop in his local diocese because it is a, a devotional prayer. Uh, it, it's not part of the liturgical prayer of the church. Um, and, and so uh, I think that, in, in my opinion, uh, the Pope is more likely to make that an option for the bishop in the local church and not legislate it for the universal church. Is it possible? Sure. But is it likely? In my opinion, I don't think so. But I am very happy that we, we call upon that great defender of God and uh, the defender of heaven uh, against the power of Satan uh, to be with us and to protect us uh, as we pray that prayer at our masses here in our diocese. Thank you. Uh, so our next question actually has to do with uh, the Synod, which I, I know that just opened. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Synod 21, 2023. And now this Synod's a little bit different than what we have seen in the past. Uh, so could you talk about what makes this particular Synod maybe a little more unique than sure. previous? Yeah, well, on October the 10th, our Holy Father Pope Francis had a Mass at the Vatican, which initiated the Synodal process, which, as you mentioned, will culminate in 2023. So it's really a, a three-year process, which in itself is unusual. Uh, there's always a process leading up to the Synods. You now, a Synod is some part of the life of the church from very, very early on. It comes from a, 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 a Greek word, uh, syn hodus, uh, which means uh, all, together on the road, with road, with road, to, together on the road. And, and, and so at certain times, especially local, uh, several uh, diocesan bishops or regional bishops or those of a country would get together, again, oftentimes to discuss a theological problem or a, um, a pastoral issue that they could handle in a, a local uh, region of the church. It differs from an ecumenical council uh, in that at an ecumenical council, all bishops from throughout the world are invited to gather at wherever, like Mount Nicaea, Constantinople. Uh, so those were all the bishops who could make it to those. That's an ecumenical council. A synod is a representative number of bishops who gather to participate in that meeting. So, so it's always been a part of the life of the church. Uh, the Second Vatican Council, when it concluded in 1965, Pope Paul VI set up a permanent structure, a, a permanent structure for the uh, 
the, the synodal process in the church. It's simply the office for the synod of bishops. And uh, since 1968, uh, there have been 18 synods, uh, uh, 15 regular synods, and um, uh, three extraordinary synods that uh, the Pope has called. So the Pope will pick a topic, and then the Vatican will send out uh, questions regarding that, and then the Conference of Bishops will discuss it, and then send delegates, maybe from the United States, we would have two or three bishops that would come to each of these synods, all, they were all held in Rome, and uh, would be participants in it, but bringing with them the thoughts of the other bishops that have been kind of uh, gathered together from the discussions. What's different about the 2023 synod is that it is a process that will involve all of the faithful. Pope Francis wanted to have what will probably be uh, the most, um, the, 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 the largest public participation in a process in history, because there are over 3,000 dioceses. Mm -hmm. And on the following Sunday, after the Pope on October the 10th, October the 17th, every diocesan bishop, as I did in our cathedral, was to have a mass to begin the process locally. So from now until April, we'll be discussing the issues of uh, being church. It's really a, a, a kind of like the church looking in a mirror and, and asking, how is it going for us as the Catholic Church today? Um, I think maybe when some Catholics hear the word synod, we might have a, a little a skeptical a cautious attitude because of what the media has been telling us that's going on in uh, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, they have been in this uh, process called a synodal path. And uh, from the outside, uh, just reading what we do from the media coverage of the German synodal process, it, it appears to be a kind of a democratic process determined by voting. And they're considering issues of doctrine and church discipline. That will not be the case for our synodal process or the one that the Pope has initiated. Here, we're really looking at ourselves to, to listen to one another, to discern together uh, what it is uh, that uh, makes us Catholic, uh, what it is that the church needs to be about uh, at this time in its history. So it, it's a time of listening, of, of, uh, of, of sharing experience uh, walking together in this synodal way and uh, and then uh, discussing certain topics that will be proposed uh, by, by the Vatican. And as you mentioned, it will culminate in a worldwide synod in 2023. And so it's this it's this vast consultative process that makes this synod very different. And I'm not sure, but it, it looks like also, in the past, only bishops were directly participating in a synod. Others would make uh, laity who are experts and theologians, religious priests would, would make presentations on topics, but only the bishops were members of the synod. Okay. It may well be that in this synod in 2023, there's a broader participation of the whole uh, members of the faithful. Uh, so we'll, we'll see how that unfolds. But at the moment, it's, it's this broad consultative process that makes the Synod preparing for 2023 uh, unique. Excellent, thank you, Bishop. Mm. I'm sure that will help answer a lot of questions uh, for our I viewers. Hope. Yes, and I know that there are some fears about the Synodal process and uh, we're, we're not following the pattern uh, of the church in Germany. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so we have one more question for, for this month. And uh, as, as we know, the, the USCCB Fall General Assembly is coming up in ab about two weeks mm -hmm. uh, from now. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there's a number of topics on the agenda. Uh, certainly, we have the Eucharistic Congress planned for, for 2024, uh, as well as the Eucharistic teaching document. And we mm -hmm. know there's been lots of speculation on the Eucharistic teaching document, certainly in you know, secular media as well as Catholic media mm -hmm. regarding what might actually be included in that document. Uh, now, I know you can't share too many details and, and the meeting has not happened as of this time, uh, but is there anything you would like to say about you know preparing for, for the USCCB meeting? Mm -hmm. meeting or what may sure. be in the uh, document. Yeah, and I, I, I invite everyone who's free and uh, to, to be able to watch uh, the coverage, that, which is televised on EWTN. Um, 
the the uh, certainly I, I think the media focus will be on the topic of the Eucharist, mm -hmm. both the the program of the Eucharistic revival, uh, which is going to go from twenty one to twenty twenty one to twenty twenty four, when we'll have a national uh, Eucharistic Congress, and and the need for us to rediscover the mystery of the Eucharist and and the the awe the amazement that we need to have in this uh, gracious act of our Lord to give Himself to us in the mystery of his body and blood under the, the signs, uh, the sacramental signs of bread and wine. So we need to rediscover and, and re-enliven uh, our, our Catholic faithful, all of us, uh, in, in, the, in awe before this mystery. And that's the purpose of the Eucharistic revival. The Eucharistic document, we have received already the, a, 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 a confidential copy of, of that to, to study and pray with and to make our comments on. Uh, it, it's called The Mystery of the Eucharist in the Life of the Church from the Bishop's Committee on Doctrine, which is chaired by our former bishop here, Bishop Kevin Rhodes. And he's doing a, a great job in, in uh, crafting that document and taking, we've had a meeting over the summer by regions, our region three, which is Pennsylvania, New Jersey, to give some of our feedback. And uh, uh, it, it was uh, you know, very open to all of the suggestions. So, so we'll see how, that, uh, how it's handled. Uh, it's a beautiful document, again, on, on the teaching of the Eucharist. A lot of focus will be on the section about who should be able to receive uh, communion. So those will be the, the, the Eucharistic Bible, the letter on the teaching document on the Eucharist. But there's so many other things that the bishops consider. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of liturgical issues. Uh, what happens is that uh, we receive from ISIL the uh, International Committee on English and the Liturgy. It's about 13 bishop conferences that preside in, uh, that uh, partake, participate in that. And, and they translate documents from the original Latin. And, and then we get to uh, comment on the translation. It goes back to them. So right, right now we have what are called the gray books. It's one of those uh, interim translations. And it's for um, Eucharistic worship outside of Mass, so devotion to the Eucharist um, and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament outside of Mass, and the uh, right of uh, Christian initiation for adults, the RCIA. So those trends, those documents are, are, are being refashioned, and we'll have a chance to comment on and then uh, approve with amendments, perhaps, uh, those liturgical documents that will go back to ISIL and eventually come out in a definitive form in English. Um, something that folks might not know about that the Bishop Conference engages in is, is that if, if there's a local cause where someone uh, uh, led an exemplary holy life and is being considered for sainthood, um, the bishop, be before the diocesan bishop, can begin that process toward beatification and canonization. Uh, he brings the cause before the the uh, U.S. Conference of Bishops, and um, so we have two such causes uh, by two different bishops. Uh, now we're not voting on the holiness of the person, <laughs> but we we get a, a little profile, two or three pages about the life of that person. One is a lay woman, another is a lay man, and. Um, uh, we, we simply say, go ahead and proceed this, uh, process this case, this, this uh, really a trial for sanctity. Uh, I've never, since I've been a bishop since uh, 2003, uh, no one, the, the conference has never turned down one of those. It's only the very beginning, and sometimes the process doesn't end in canonization, but at least we have to authorize, the body of bishops authorizes the beginning of the process, and then it's all up to the diocesan bishop and his curia to continue that cause. So we have two of those uh, that will be considered before. So there are uh, quite a few things that, uh, that will be on our docket, uh, elections. Uh, so it, it'll be a busy time. And it's our first time in quite some time to be in person. So we'll be gathered uh, in person in Baltimore uh, for our November plenary session. Yeah, definitely sounds like a busy meeting. It, sh it is. It's very busy. People say, "Well, how how were things?" Over? I never leave the hotel. I, <laughs> I, wherever wherever we happen to be, I I, I, move, I go in the day we start, and I come out when it's time to go home, and I don't get to play the tourist uh, <laughs> uh, around the, around town. So, but it is busy. It's a it's a good time to be together for us, and there's so many other things happening uh, on the side uh, when we're not gathered uh, as as a whole body. We have other meetings going on. Uh, all of us, many of us, are involved in other 
uh, groups, national groups, and we often have our um, board meetings and things during that time. So it's packed with activity. Well, Bishop, thank you as always for joining us. And, uh, you know, we certainly covered a lot today. I'm, I'm sure our viewers appreciate the time that you answered their questions and that Good. you give to us. And, and it's it's always a joy to have you join us down here. Thanks, Rachel. And I always hear, I, I just recently heard uh, two different women participating in one of our programs uh, say that they watch every one of these. And I was with our young adults at the Theology on Tap recently. And several of them come and said, I've, I've watched all of these sessions and the Faith Alive sessions. Right. So it's always good to hear from those who are uh, watching uh, and, and, and know that uh, there are some viewers out there. So thank you. Thank you to uh, those who are watching us. Well, if you have a question for Bishop Gaynor, feel free to drop it in the comments here on Facebook, uh, shoot us a comment on YouTube, or you can always send us an email at communications at hbgdiocese.org. Thank you for watching and have a great night.